Good morning. Welcome this morning. What a beautiful fall day. Uh, we're really glad that all of you are here and uh, exciting times. Uh, we've got lots going on here at the church and I uh, always just enjoy coming and seeing everybody uh, here on Sunday mornings in worship and also throughout the week. Um, got a few announcements to go over just quickly as we get into our time of worship. Embrace Life uh, is having a single mom support group and Bible study that's going to be starting on the 29th. Also, remember to be donating to Operation Christmas Child. This is the last week to be doing the school supplies out on the bus. Uh, in your bulletin, all these announcements are in here as well. Um, Monday nights are prayer nights. If you, need, if you need to come in here and have a time of prayer, or come, if you want to come pray over this church, uh, or some people here, please come and join uh, on my Monday nights to pray. Also, the third Monday uh, of every month, they have a worship night. Where we just sing songs for, uh, worship songs for about an hour and uh, do some uh, scripture reading and some praise. Also, for this service, uh, we on October 1st, if you have kids, uh, remember that now when we, we will switch to uh, at the beginning of the service, you can go ahead and take your kids, either to Little Tykes or toddlers at that time. Uh, or also, Kids Quest won't dismiss in the middle of the service. You, they can go ahead and go to Kids Quest. We'll have Children's Church the entire time. Uh, so they can go down there starting... Uh, at the beginning of the service, starting on October 1st. Uh, so note that change. Also, uh, Coffee with a Cop is happening on October 4th. Uh, that's from uh, 9 to 10 down at Java. We're meeting with local law enforcement just to say thank you and uh, to, uh, to also uh, interact with them, free coffee and uh, donuts. Uh, so please come down and do that with us. Also, we're having a welcome to NCC class on October 8th. If you would like to join the church and know more about what we're doing here, I'd like to volunteer for some things. Come sign up for that class. We'll do that uh, during Sunday school uh, there in the library at 945. Um, all right. Well, if you'd want to stand with me, please, for the reading of God's word as we get into a time of worship. Today we're in 2 Peter 3, starting in verse 11. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. We are looking forward to the new heaven and new earth he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom of God, gave, the wisdom that God gave him. Speaking of these things, in all of his letters, some of his comments are hard to understand, and those who are ignorant and, and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of Scripture, and this will result in their destruction. You already know these things, dear friends, so be on guard. Then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to him, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together this morning. I was buried my shame who could carry that God away it was my tomb till I met you I was breathing but not alive try to hide it was my doom till I made you call my name you 
closer to you. Father, just give us what we need. Help us to, to uh, know your will. Help us to do it. And uh, thank you that you're here with us. Amen. I search the world. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still. 
Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinners, wake up the saints. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be a church that's ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing even so. morning. Beautiful day, beautiful weekend. We had a lot of fun. We got to celebrate my daughter's birthday this weekend and also celebrate a third grandchild on the way. 
Another boy. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. I told her, hey, my, I had all brothers. Tyler had a brother. I mean, I guess it's just the way it is. I just want him healthy. It's what I pray for, right? And so we're thankful for that. Um, lot, it's good. God's good. Last time I did communion meditation on Throwback Sunday a couple weeks ago, it was at the end of service, which was, uh, it was good. It was a different time uh, of when we usually do it. And uh, we worshiped together. We heard the word of God together, and we had an opportunity to be very focused on God. Um, and it was a culmination of our time together. And as I was kind of pondering that, it was like, communion's good no matter when you do it. We just got to make sure we're ready to do it, right? Ready to commune with the Lord. This is the time to remember what God did for each and every one of us. And there's no greater act of love than what Jesus did for us. We remember what he did, but also why. And it's because he loves us so much that he did that. Why would he go to the cross, take all that sin? Because he loves us so much. And man, he woke me up yesterday morning. He really did. Sometimes he does that to me, and I, I'm, I'm just, okay, what do I need to pray for? What? But he just laid on my heart. I love you. And uh, it felt good. It feels good to know that, right? And to remember that. And that's what we're doing during this time. Remember how much he loves us. And what he's called us to do is go share that love with others. And what that looks like. And that love is a guarantee of our hope with him forever, too. So we get to remember all that. There are several things that happened when Jesus breathed his last breath that day. And when he woke me up, I read through some of these. The earth shook. One of the soldiers that was there even said, surely this is the Son of God. Dead were raised. But the first thing that was listed in Matthew 27, 51, in Mark 15, 38, and in Luke 23, 45 was this. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. There's no, there's no separation anymore between us and God. And I think sometimes we think there is. We, we create separation. He doesn't. That's been taken away. Our sin creates separation. And that's what we got to remember. But when we repent and turn to him, there's no separation. He's right there. And it feels good to know that, doesn't it? Maybe I needed that reminder. Maybe you did. But his death didn't just conquer the grave. It allowed us access to him on a personal level, on an intimate level. He doesn't just love us. He desires us. He wants that. This is a special time. As I said a couple of weeks ago, let's make it a special time. Let's be quiet and honor it. But man, it's special because we get to do it together too. We're all in, in the same place and we're all thinking about the same thing. Jesus. And what that meant. So when we get ready to take this, we remember that bread and what it represents. It represents his body that he, that he gave up for us. And we take the cup and we remember the blood that he freely shed for us because he loves us. And remember, it's not just today we can be intimate with him. It's every day. Every day we can get into his word. Every day we can pray. Every day we can worship. And every day we remember he loves us. And he has a plan for us. And it's good. And the promise of eternity, it's wonderful. Our, our Abba Father loves us. And he's good always. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we get to really focus and remember what you did for us and why. Thank you, Lord, for giving us access to you daily. Every moment we have, we have that opportunity to talk to you and to remember what you've done for us. Father, thank you for showing your peace and love to us during our quiet time with you and revealing your heart to us. You do, Lord, when we get alone with you, we are in your word. 
Thank you for being there. Thank you for revealing yourself. I pray that you will be with each of us throughout this week. And that when we take that time, your peace and your love, they just overflow. And no matter what you have us doing this week, Lord, help us to take you with us. May others see you in the things we do and the things we say. God, I thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace that you extend to us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Will you guys pray with me over the tithes and offering? Heavenly Father, Lord, we just, uh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this beautiful fall weather that we're having and uh, or just all the blessings that you've given us. So, Lord, I just uh, ask now that during this time of giving that uh, we give back just as freely as you gave to us. And, uh, Lord, we just, we just pray that we can give out of the love that comes from our hearts, Lord, and, and Lord, that we just give to you. Help this money to uh, further your kingdom and do your work, Lord. We love you and we pray us in Jesus' name. Amen. It's time for Children's Church, a kids' class and extended session. So, time for you guys to go ahead and take off. And don't forget, tonight at 5 o'clock, it is uh, high school youth down at the Rock from 5 to 6.30. So, uh, meet down there. So, kids' class, time to go. want to make a few uh, announcements. Uh, this is our last um, Sunday for uh, preaching in the book of First Peter. Next month, we're going to start a series in uh, demonology, getting ready to study uh, the idea of what Satan is doing. The real stuff, not uh, talking about some things that he gets in trouble for that he's not doing, uh, but going into that. And then on October 28th, we're going to have a, a movie night. Uh, come on in and uh, Watch free movie and popcorn as long as you don't spill. Karen will get on to you if you spill in the sanctuary. Don't spill the popcorn. Um, but it's uh, nefarious. Come on and watch that with us. Um, we got a lot going on. Everybody say, all hands on deck. Okay. Some of you nudged your neighbor. Some of you didn't, weren't awake, and I'm not even started preaching yet. So uh, all hands on deck. There you go. We've got a lot going on in October. Um, so make sure you pay attention. October 1st, we are changing things a little bit. Uh, extended session and Kids Quest will start right as soon as second service starts. Trying to free up some space so we can have plenty of seats in here. Uh, we are growing, and I, I thank God for more people coming in. Uh, it, it's great, but we want to make sure we got plenty of room for that. So that starts next Sunday. October 15th at 6.30, we're having Wave of Light. Uh, that's for families who have lost loved ones. Uh, uh, and um, uh, miscarriages, uh, and so um, uh, we've lost five miscarriages, and uh, so every year it's, it's a national event, worldwide event, October 15th. Uh, come on in if you want, want to give us uh, the birth uh, t the dates or names. We put them, uh, those names on a, on a little bag and put a candle in it, and we come in and we sing songs and we just kind of uh, do that together for an hour. So it's uh, any names through miscarriages. Um, uh, Vicki and a few people put that on a time of praise and worship. Um, you never get over that. And this is just a way of honoring that. Please come in and participate. October 8th, uh, we're going to have a wonderful time. Uh, we have a world-renowned author. Uh, we've got two, Daryl Boston, but also... Uh, we've got, do uh, you want to tell about your book, Young Lady? On October 8th. On October 8th, all right. Uh, we're going to hear about a wonderful book about a wonderful uncle, and I want uh, Brad and his family to know that I've got my copy first. That's what I'm telling the family anyway. Uh, but we're going to have uh, Karen Cox tell about a book she wrote about her uncle. Uh, and uh, she's going to uh, do that, and you can buy that book in the office, and the proceeds goes to Operation Christmas Child, and that's a big deal, and it, uh, a lot of that's going on on then. Also, October is the day that, uh, the month that we do uh, Faith in Action. We just have first service on that Sunday, and then we do service projects all throughout the community, and so be ready for that. We're thinking we're changing the date on that, so be ready to hear when that date is next week on that. Uh, also, October 29th. We're doing a fall harvest festival, and we got blow-up uh, toys, and I was going to see if we could have one, because one of those is going to be a big slide, I think. I hope. I voted for the big slide. I think I got outvoted by too many good Christians. But uh, So be ready for that. We're going to have a um, food truck available. 
We called the city. They're going to block off this road out here. We're going to have, I think, all kinds of games, even for some adults. And we got three big boxes out here to put candy in. And we're going to have Pi the Preacher. And what the deal's going to be is we're, we're asking for volunteers because we're going to do trunk or treat and stuff. No, you don't have to dress up or anything. And whoever has the most candy in that box, they're going to get pied that night. And I think right now it's a tie between Justin and Garrett. I got a bad neck. So, you know... I think Justin needs it more than me. We've got a lot going on, and so what I'd like to do right now, it's exciting to be part of the church, and we're looking to be, be in the community. And, and this past week, I was praying, and, and something come to me, and it, the word impact come to me. And you've got a contact to impact. And we need to be a church that's impacting our community for Jesus Christ. And you've got to get involved, and you've you got to impact them with the truth. And the only way to do that is by doing a lot of these events. So what I'd like for us to do is let's take a moment and pray for this, shall we? Father God, I just thank you so much for a church that is active, that's involved. And we do that, Father, because we love each other and we love our community. And Father, we don't want to go to stand before your throne empty-handed. And Father, we know that You sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for our sins and he arose from the grave. And then you told us that believe that message to go preach that message. And Father, we're trying to use every avenue we can to tell somebody else about Jesus. Father, thank you for loving us. And Father, I pray now that as I am opening up your word, I pray we hear from you. Let it be your spirit that is heard, Father. You preach today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to let you know we're preaching out of the book of 1 Peter. Peter, when you study him, and I I had to take two years of Greek and to study, and then the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, and Greek is a hard language. It's a dead language. No one speaks that language anymore. And when you study the writings of Peter, you realize In modern language, that boy was a redneck. He did not understand the Greek language. When you try to translate it from Greek to English, the boy flunked. He had no idea how to to write. And it was hard. But let me tell you what. He had a master's degree in theology because he was right there with Jesus every step of the way. And what he wrote in First and Second Peter is this, church, it's time. It's time. It's time to shine. It's time to quit playing the game. It's time to quit just showing up. It's time to be the church of Jesus Christ. It is time to be victorious. It's not time to swing back. It's not time to to just be present. It's not time to just say, well, they know what we're thinking. It's time to shout it from the rooftops. When was the last time you walked outside And you looked up because you just might thought today could be the day you see chariots coming. And you see all those who are dead in Christ coming back. When was the last time you were listening for a trumpet call? When was the last time you were listening for the shout? And Well, not today, so I better get busy. Or have we allowed the busyness of this world to rock us to sleep, to get us off our game? When was the last time you felt victorious as a believer in Jesus Christ? When was the last time you got your mind off of all the reasons why not and all the reasons why? When was the last time you thought, hey, I need to get high stepping because he's coming back? When was the last time you knew you were going to be the winner? 
Or are you too busy trying to just keep what you got? Today we're going to end the book of 1 Peter. And, and one of the things that he read today in chapter 3 was, there's going to be a day it's all going to be burned up. And you're trying to keep what's going to be burned up. And you're too worried majoring in the minors. And you need to be knocking on your neighbor's door and saying, hey, you need to get ready. And he was reading a time, there's a time coming, very real, could be soon. Look at the world, man. We're finding new ways to be dumb about the way we're living. I'm looking at, <laughs> I'm finishing up some Old Testament reading right now, and I'm looking at Israel of the Old Testament. And in the book of Joshua, as I read here a few months ago, as Joshua saying, you decide who you're going to follow, whether the gods, all the gods we just whipped, or you're going to follow the God of the Bible, well, we'll follow the God of the Bible. He says, we've not even made it to the promised land, and you've already, you've already left him. And Joshua said that to them, you've already polluted yourself to follow these things that aren't even so. And how quickly we as Christians have polluted ourselves and, and we not only take this, this, this is the truth, but we want to add things to it. Or we take our markers and I like this, but I'm going to just, eh, I can make it better. No, you can't. Don't you realize that Jesus was there at Genesis 1-1? And he's going to be the one there at Revelation 22. He was there at the beginning. And what he said at the beginning is what he says at the end. What we need to be doing is, hey, if the Bible says it, that's what I'm going to follow. And what we need is good godly leaders. And what we need to do is live on grace. And here's what we find out in the book of 1 Peter. This is what grace does for us. It produces security so that I can live my life. It makes me not afraid of condemnation. Because the world wants to condemn me. Now, Jesus and the Holy Spirit may convict me, but conviction promotes change. Not heartbreak. And there are times when I sit at the Lord's table or I open my Bible and I feel convicted. Hey, I need to change that. It produces sobriety in thought, clears up my thinking. When I receive the Holy Spirit, my eyes are open to the truth. I'm no longer polluting myself to things that aren't so anymore. I am clear in thought. It produces submission. Submission to the Holy Spirit. I will go where you want me to go. I will say what you want me to say. I will speak up when I need to speak up. I will be quiet when I need to be quiet. I will step out when I need to step out. I will step back when I need to step back. I will allow the Holy Spirit to lead me. I will submit. It allows harmony. Look around the room today and all the different people groups and different backgrounds and we're working together for a common good. How is that possible? It's possible because of grace. The book of Acts, their characteristics, it was a church of grace. How do you learn to get along? It's grace. And it produces service. Here in October, we're going to go out and work together. Why? Because of grace. In, in the book of First Peter here in chapter 5, we see that he as an elder talks to the other elders. And he tells them, I appeal to you as a fellow elder, as a witness of Christ Jesus' sufferings, who also will share in the future glory that will yet be revealed. What does he tell the elders to do? He says, keep your focus ahead. And keep bringing them along. Keep your eye on the chief elder, which is Jesus Christ. But he says, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing. Be a willing shepherd. As God wants you to be not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. There's different words here used in the Greek that, he, that he's using. And in the New Testament, there is a variety of words used for the elders of the church. In our church, when you look at the leadership of the church, 
we don't have a single elder. We have an elders. We have 10, and, and next month is uh, staff evaluation, and I'm not bragging on them because of that, though it shouldn't hurt. <laughs> but we have good leadership here. And I've been in church for, and ministry for over about, about 30 years now, and, and I've been in some churches that, <laughs> And the reason I say that is because do they make mistakes? Yeah, they do make mistakes. They're men. They're, but what they're doing is they are daily praying for this church. And they are in Scripture, and they are seeking God's will for this. And, and here's the names given here for what their job description is. It's the word pastor, and that's referring to how they care. They're, they're shepherds. This means nurturing and gentle and they're protective. These men are protective. They're not going to allow false teaching to come in. And they're going to care for you. They're going to be the ones praying with you when you're sick. They're going to be the ones nurturing you along. And if you're, if you're getting off on the wrong track, they're going to be the ones, hey, yeah, you know what, you need to get back over here. They're the, over, they're the authority. Jesus is the final authority, but he placed these men in authority. You say, well, I voted him in. Well, that's because we've Americanized the way that God organized. But you put men in who already have these qualifications. You don't put them in the office to hope they grow into it. And they're mature in their faith. You don't put them in there hoping they mature into the faith. They're already matured into the faith. And that's what you're wanting them to do. And, and here's what he says about these men. Number one, you want them to be willing to serve. And the first qualification in 1 Timothy and Titus is they desire the position. They do it for spiritual reasons. They understand that everything that we're doing is, is spiritual. They lead by example. Paul said it best, follow me as I follow Christ. They do it with hope. 1 Peter and 2 Peter, one of the key words through this with grace is hope. Our theme for the church is Norton Christian Church, a place to find hope. This world is drowning in hopelessness. And they will try everything they can just, just to find, if they can't find hope, they want numb. And there's one reason why people will come to church it's because of a loss. They lost a job. They're losing their marriage. They're losing someone and they love so much that there's a loss in their life. Well, I'll, I'll run to church. They need to find hope here. And if everything starts at the top. We will follow our leaders. We've got to have good, godly men in, in charge of that. Then we'll follow after them. If we have hope at the top, we'll have hope following. If we have grace at the top, we will follow our leader's example. I'm thankful for men at the top. Do they make mistakes? They're going to make mistakes. But mistakes is proof of trying. Whenever we make goals, whenever I make goals, I make a one-year goal, a three-year goal, and a five-year goal. And my number one goal is don't die. <laughs> but my goal at the end of a day did I make God smile? And as a church, our goal must be, did we please God with what we're doing? First Peter 5, 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. You see, we're working on grace. And the first aspect of grace is it saves you, but the grace that saves you must change you. You don't come to God and stay the way you came. And if grace hasn't changed you, and what so many people want to do, they want to add Jesus to their life and think they're saved. You're not saved. If grace hasn't changed you, then you don't know the grace that Jesus offers in the Bible. The grace that Jesus offers in the Bible takes the sinner and makes him a saint. You're no longer what you used to be. You become something brand new, a new creation, a new creature. You're no longer what you used to be. That person don't live here anymore. I am no longer what I used to be. 
And thank God for that. Thank God for grace. Saul didn't say Saul. He became Paul. He no longer killed Christians. He wrote 13 books of the New Testament. That's who we become. I become somebody empowered. Peter, the guy that denied Christ on the day he needed him to speak up, was the one that denied him on that night. But the day of Pentecost, he was the one in the crowd of thousands stood up and said, Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, the man you crucified is both Lord and King and Savior of the world. He, they could have killed him on that day. But instead, 3,000 come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's what grace does. It empowers you to be what God wants you to be. And if grace hasn't challenged you to change, it probably didn't save your soul. There are different attitudes and actions that we're going to see today in chapter 5. And these are the attitudes and actions of being victorious in this world. And I'm going to flip your script. And these are not the attitudes and actions that the world wants us to have. These are the attitudes and actions that the Bible says we've got to have if we're going to be victorious in this world. And the first one is be humble. And he's talking to the young men. Likewise, be subject to the elders. And I believe there must have been a problem in this church that these young men wouldn't submit to the leading of these elders. But I'm going to let you know that this could be all of us as members of this church. If we're going to move forward in victory, we need to go up to our leaders and say, here we are. We're following after you. Take the lead. We're going to follow whatever you say. Because you see... That's what he's saying here. Be subject to your elders and all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's the opposite of what the world says. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. This is talking about God's sovereignty and everything. I submit to his sovereignty in my life that he may exalt you at the proper time. Casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. If we're going to be the church of victory in this world, if we're going to be the church of hope in this world, that means we're going to be a responsive congregation. And that's what grace allows us to be. We're going to do something. Instead of just show up on Sunday, we're going to respond to what the world throws at us. We're going to bring something back and respond to it by the leading of our leaders. The elders set forth a, a proposal, set forth a plan. Hey, this is what the world is needing. This is what our society needs. And this is what we're going to give them. We're going to follow after that. God loves the humble. Salvation starts with humility. Growth in salvation, growth in our Lord Jesus Christ is when we humble ourselves. And humble and submission are attitudes and actions that are inseparable. You can't have one without the other. And both of these are actions of faith. Every leader of the Old Testament, from David, Moses, um, King Saul, every one of those had to submit themselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit, to the leading of God, and submit themselves to when God brought them forth. They did that. And God used them. Moses had to battle at the burning bush. I can't do it. I can't do it. And God wouldn't stop until he was willing to submit to his leading. David was in training. And each step was him humbling himself. And whenever he had a little bit of pride, God had to go back and break him again. We've got to humble ourselves for God's leading. He actually says, clothe yourselves with humility. In, in Proverbs 3, verse 34, it says God opposes the proud. He actually will break them, but it says God graces those with humility. In Proverbs 6, 16, and 17, he says God hates the sin of pride. Do you know there's, there's things that, that says that God hates? Proverbs actually says there are people who God hates, and one of those is people who are full of pride. When we get in here to the next one here, and, and uh, it says to be watchful, one of the th reasons it says to be watchful in, in this passage of Scripture, one of the cracks in us that Satan attacks is the sin of pride. Be sober in spirit. 
Why? Because when we start getting prideful, when we don't think we have no reason to repent, isn't it a shame that many churches today don't want to use that word in salvation? In order to receive God's grace, we must repent. You cannot become saved without repentance. You cannot become saved without submitting what you are and giving it over. And here it says, be sober in spirit. Go back and read the five chapters of 1 Peter and how many times he tells us to be sober in our thinking. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, eat you up, tear you up. I tried to watch the Colorado game yesterday. Can we say they got ate up yesterday? 40 some to 6, and I think the 6 was a give me. <laughs> that was an 8-up game. But resist him. Do you know, when the Bible says you can resist the devil, that means you have power over him. He is, he's not even a match for you. Why do you think that he's a match for you? Why are you afraid of him? Why do we believe the Hollywood hype, that he's this great big huge giant, that he has more power than you have? Why don't we believe 1 John 4, 4, that greater is he that is in you that's in the world? Why don't we believe James 4, 7, that says he must flee when you tell him to flee? Why don't we believe that we have the power of the Almighty God within inside of us, that we... That he is no match for the church and the gates of hell cannot prevail over us why do we think that he isn't match for us he's not so why are we allowing him to take things over and to walk all over the church he's no match for you he's no match for your family men if you'll pray over your family he is no match for you but resist him. Stand firm in the faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering and, and, and are being accomplished by your brothers all over the world. You're not in some strange situation. Your suffering is not new to you. You're not alone in this. Wonder why he chose lion. Could it be that at this time in the Colosseums in Rome, Christians were being put to death and these wild beasts these lions were being paraded out in the middle of a coliseum and Christians were standing there or kneeling to their God being devoured by these wild beasts but I bet you they were singing hymns of praise we've got to pay four dollars for gas we think the world's coming to an end it ain't the same, folks. We have a great enemy that's powerful and intelligent. But he's no match for us. He knows scripture. He quotes scripture. He quoted it to Jesus, but Jesus has quoted it back. You better know your scripture. He has hosts of demons who can assist him to attack us, but he is no match for us. He tells us to be watchful. But he's looking for us to be proud and too proud to ask for forgiveness. He's looking for us to be too proud to ask for help. I can do this on my own. He tells us two commands, be self-controlled. When, can I ask you an honest question? Have you ever lost control? How did you feel once you lost control? Have you ever lost your alertness? Here's the last thing he tells us to do. Be hopeful. That's a command. Don't lose your hope. The last few verses, and I'll let you read it, but he tells us this. After you have suffered for a little while, there's a day the suffering will be over. The last verse there, verse 14, but greet one another with a, with a kiss of love. We need each other. You cannot do this life alone. Get in a church and help each other. Because this is the deal. Today, like any other day, today more than ever, the church is facing fiery trials. The church, the Christian, we need each other. Prepare each other for the attack. Tell somebody, hey, keep going, I got you. Faithful service in Jesus Christ is challenging. It's exhausting. 
but it's rewarding. It's the only service that's rewarding. Be faithful. Here's what he tells us, the reasons to be faithful, to be hopeful. We have hope because God's grace covers it all, Ephesians chapter 2, 8. He tells us to be faithful because the end of all this is coming. He tells us to be faithful because God's grace covers it all. It's all God's grace, all God's glory. We have hope because of this. We should have hope because our suffering will end someday. It's going to end. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. We should be hopeful because we know that all of this will end in glory. He says our light suffering. In 1 Corinthians 4.17, Paul says our momentary, momentary and light affliction. Paul was shipwrecked. Paul was bitten by a serpent. Paul was beaten and left for dead twice. Paul was thrown in prison. And Paul says our light and momentary affliction. Paul called that light momentary because he says what we're going through can't surpass what we will receive. Be hopeful because glory is on its way. Be hopeful because glory is on its way. I'm reminded of what happened in Matthew 27 when Jesus is on the cross and he cries out, Father, forgive them. But as he's standing there on the cross, I believe it's in verses 39 and 40. And the people are saying, you said that you're going to tear this building down, the temple down in three days and rebuild it. I don't see you doing it. And they're mocking him. But the very thing he said he was going to do, he's doing it right in front of their eyes. Because he's talking about his own body. You're going, well, we already know that. The promise that he was supposed to fulfill, he's fulfilling. Well, we already know that, Nate. Then why don't you know that promise in your own life? Why do you get caught up in forgetting that God has never failed on a promise? Why do you forget that God is not early, but he's not late, he's on time? What about in... Mark chapter 5 with Jairus. Remember that story? Jairus comes up to him and says, Hey, my daughter is sick. Would you come heal her? So Jesus, on his way, and on his his way, he feels somebody touches him of his garment. Hey, power left me. Who touched me? Jesus. You're surrounded by a crowd. How will we know who touched you? Somebody touched me. And a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years speaks up, and he has a conversation, stops, and has a conversation with her. Now, if I was Jarius, hey, this is my time, my blessing, my opportunity for healing. You don't have time to stop. Quit stopping. Let's go. This is my, have you ever, why is everyone else getting blessed and I'm not? Why are you answering everyone else's prayers and my prayers aren't being answered? That would be me instead of Jarius. Jarius finds out, don't bother the teacher. Your daughter is dead. How would you respond to that? Why did you stop and help this lady when you promised me? Well, that's not how Jairus responded. And instead of receiving a healing, he received his daughter back from the dead. He received a resurrection. Be hopeful. Glory is on the way. So when was the last time you went outside and looked for that toe in the sky? When was the last time church you decided, hey, you know what, it's time to speak up. Enough is enough. When was the last time you were so full of hope, people around you, how can you be so full of hope? Because glory is on the way. My God promised and he's not failed me yet, so I'm not going to give up hope. I'm not going to give up faith. Because you see, I want my boys to know and my family to know, hey, you know what? It might be my last day. If it is, 
And if God should tarry and take me home, that you know, there's been a few days of my driving abilities that my wife questioned whether or not we're going to make it home. So maybe it's my last day. So either I praise God here or I praise Him there. But I'm going to praise Him. And if I praise Him there, honey, I ain't making an October 15th the wave of light. Because I get to hold them. All five of those that we've missed, I get to hold them. And all those funerals that I have to held here with all those righteous saints that's gone on before, I get to go greet them again. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. And if today were to be my last day, I'll tell your dad, hey. It's going to, I'll, I'll see him. It's going to be worth it. So I'm going to be hopeful. And in a world of chaos and in a world of misery and in a world that's turned upside down, I'm going to stay hopeful because glory is on the way. And whether he comes back to take me home or I go to meet him, I'm going to stay hopeful because the world that's falling apart needs a church that's not. And when they're crumbling around and they, I, I'm done, I have nowhere else to go, will you tell me how you're keeping it together? Yeah, I will. Let me tell you about Jesus. Because I'm going to preach him crucified. I'm going to tell you, you need to change. You need to change your life to meet him. Throw off everything that hinders you. Throw off the sin that so easily entangles you. And get your life with Jesus Christ. Oh, I don't know what to do. Well, sit down here with me and brother, I'll tell you how it's done. But what if I fail? Join the crowd. But we're going to do it together. And I'm going to stay hopeful. Because glory is on the way. What about you? The Bible says there's a day coming and every eye will see him. I want you to see him. I want you to long for that day. I want you to be waiting. I want you to step outside. Well, not today, so I better get to work. I better go tell somebody about Jesus. I don't want to go to heaven empty-handed. Stay hopeful. Because glory is on the way. He's not failed me yet. And he's not going to start today. Go tell somebody, glory is on the way. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, man, that'd be my great pleasure to tell you about it. If you're struggling, can I help you with your struggle? as we stand in sing.
way all right if you're a guest here today go see Garrett he's got a gift for you all right and don't forget to say go Cowboys or <laughs> uh, not or not all right see you guys next week I was very